It's Monday, April 1st. This is PSN News. Tonight, we'll bring you more details on the charges against 17 UPUA candidates with endorsement through slander, as well as Joe Biden's response following the recent allegations. We also have more on the Penn State student who was shot this past Saturday, as well as details on President Trump's threat to close the U.S.-Mexico border. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Michael Sneff. And I'm Melanie Weltner. In the aftermath of the first ever fatal shooting involving an officer of the State College Police Department when 29-year-old Osaze Osagi was killed by police gunfire, the family of the victim has hired two local attorneys, Kathleen Yurchak and Andrew Sherbin, to represent them. Osagi, who is African-American and autistic, was shot and killed during an officer response to a mental health warrant at his apartment complex on Old Bullsburg Road, March 20th. The family has stressed the importance of a, quote, rigorous, independent, and transparent investigation into the role that mental health and race may have played into the shooting, end quote. Brent Rice has re recently announced that he'll be dropping out of the race for a seat on the State College Borough Council. As a recent graduate and UPUA veteran, Rice hoped him running would, quote, spark meaningful dialogue in our community, unquote, as well as hopefully be a step in the right direction for building a better life for residents. Despite dropping out of the race, Rice states, quote, in this manner, he already has been successful, unquote. With Rice out of the race, four other non-incumbent candidates remain with hopes of securing the four open seats. Mark your calendars as the State College Municipal Primary is currently scheduled for Tuesday, May 21st. The UPUA Elections Commission has charged 17 UPUA candidates with endorsement through slander in a recent report. The report states that a member of the Penn State College Democrats, while campaigning for students endorsed by College Democrats, referred to candidates not endorsed by the organization as, quote, racist, sexist assholes, end quote. The Election Commission found that the individual, whose name has been redacted, made remarks that were, quote, slanderous, defamatory, and go against the values held by this university and this student government, end quote. All 17 candidates were deemed responsible by the report and as a result saw a decrease in their allotted spending from $100 to $99. Because of the commission's investigation, the results of the 14th Assembly election were delayed for nearly two hours. Nicholas Flacco, a Penn State student, was shot in the chest and killed Saturday night in Philadelphia. Flacco was apparently home for the weekend to celebrate his 20th birthday by attending the Phillies game with friends. He was tailgating after the game when an altercation broke out between Flacco and the man who pulled out the gun and fatally shot him. The man is still at large. The Philadelphia Fraternal Order of Police Lodge No. 5 is offering a reward of $10,000 to anyone who comes forward with information that leads to an arrest. Stay tuned because after the break, Emma Creamer will bring you the latest in entertainment news. Welcome back to PSN News. I'm Emma Creamer with your entertainment update. The annual Moving On Battle of the Bands competition played out this past weekend for all that attended the event. Eight bands, including Queen Blues, TV Dinners, The Idea, and Forest Resources, competed for the spot of opening act for the 2019 festival. Each group performed a few of their original songs, and the judges were left to decide the winner. In the end, the last group to perform in the battle, The Idea, was awarded the victory of this year's competition. This past weekend, the lineup for the 2019 Moving On Festival was announced. The American indie rock band Group Love will be headlining the festival and will be joined by several other performers, including ASAP Ferg, Bryce Vine, and Snake Hips. Moving On 2019 is set to begin at 3.30 p.m. on April 26th at the IM Fields. The festival is open to anyone 18 and older with a valid Penn State or government issue ID. Additional security measures added this year State attendees will not be allowed to bring bottles or bags into the venue arena area. Grammy-nominated rapper Nipsey Hussle was shot and killed outside of his clothing store in Los Angeles, California on Sunday afternoon. Two other victims were shot during the incident and are currently recovering at the hospital. 
Celebrities all throughout the music industry took to social media to share the impact Hustle had on their lives. John Legend, J. Cole, Iggy Azalea, and Drake all shared the memories they had of the late artist and how he was gone too soon. Nipsey Hussle was just 33 years old. That's your entertainment update. Stay tuned because after the break, Alexa Arcuti has the latest on sports. Welcome back to PSN News. I'm Alexa Arcuti with your sports update. Freshman Michael Daly broke his own record in the 1650 freestyle this past Saturday to conclude the final day of the NCAA Men's Swimming and Diving Championships. The Nittany Lions finished the meet with a score of 27, placing them in 29th place, the highest finish since 2015. Daly finished 33rd in the 200-yard back with a time of 1 minute 43 seconds and 8 milliseconds, which kept him as the third fastest 200-back swimmer in Penn State history. Daly concluded his day by breaking his own school record with a time of 15 minutes, 2 seconds, and 66 milliseconds in the 1650 free. Sophomore Gabe Castano ended his NCAA championship debut with a 37th place finish in the 100 free with a time of 43 seconds and 26 milliseconds. The number 37 ranked Penn State men's tennis team earned two doubleheader wins on Sunday to, to, to secure three wins this weekend. The Nittany Lions defeated Wisconsin 6-1 and St. Bonaventure 7-0 in addition to 5-2 over Minnesota on Friday. Penn State won two of three double matches against Wisconsin to claim the first point of the match. The pair of Constant de la Bassetier and Gabriel Nemeth secured a win over their Wisconsin competitors. The pair is now 11-4 at number one doubles and have won their last eight straight. Penn State won with a shutout against St. Bonaventure with a final score of 7-0. The Nittany Lions won two of three double matches and then won all six of the single matches to secure the win. The Baltimore Orioles defeated the New York Yankees 7-5 at Yankee Stadium this weekend. J.A. Happ of the Yankees got off to a rough start with his first appearance of the season, allowing a three-run home run in the first inning. Luis Sessa stepped up to relieve Happ, who allowed two hits, walked two, and struck out five batters. Gary Sanchez hit his first home run of the season after striking out in his first three at-bats. Aaron Judge drove in two runs with a single, but struck out four times. Gleyber Torres went two for five with a double and a single. Torres is hitting .417 on the season. That was your sports update. Stay tuned because after the break, we'll bring you an exclusive interview with the PWPW Conference Director and Thon Director of Women in Business. Hello, I'm Erin Alessandroni and welcome back to PSN News. Tonight we have Emma Perchalski, the PWPW Conference Director, and Emma Rimbeck, the Thon Director for Women in Business. They're here to talk with us about what their club does and the importance of it, especially now. Thank you ladies so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, so could you tell audience members a little bit about what the mission of WIB is and what made you want to get involved? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you so much for having us. Um, the overarching mission of Women in Business is really just focused on sort of like engaging um, the female student population with the corporate world more. Um, our four pillars are networking, leadership, community service, as well as professional development. Um, personally, why I wanted to get involved um, was just like I saw that there was so much opportunity within the organization, very well run. Um, there were a lot of engagement opportunities with different um, corporations and all of the individuals were just like super motivated. That's amazing. And you mentioned um, professional development opportunities, and I know you ladies have a huge event coming up in April, the PWPW Conference. Could you tell us a little bit more about that um, and what attendees can potentially expect? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this conference sort of began like 11 years ago. So this is the 11th year. Um, it's a two-day event at the Nittany Line in this year. And essentially, um, it brings together around 250 individuals, half like professionals, half students. Um, and it was really focused to um, sort of engage like alumni, faculty, students, and professionals um, in this opportunity to just hear from dynamic speakers and um, eat some good food as well as network with one another. And so this year, we have the um, CEO, Lisa Latoff Perlo of Celebrity Cruises. We have Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer um, of Johnson & Johnson, Wanda Hope. She's also a Penn State alum. And then we also have Manit Chauhan, who is the um, executive judge and chef 
on the show Chopped. Um, so it's yeah, really a great opportunity to sort of just like meet a bunch of different super dynamic speakers um, and network with other individuals. Congratulations on getting those amazing people to come to State College. I'll have to go home and register. Thank you. <laughs> Um, how about other networking opportunities or events that you guys hold on campus? Yes, yeah, so like Emma mentioned, our four pillars have to do with professional development and community service. So as the THON director, I um, plan and organize all of our fundraisers leading up to THON weekend, as well as plan different events with our THON families. And then for the professional development side, we do a lot of corporate events with different companies that come to Penn State and seek out women in business to, because they know that our members are very involved. And then, um, for instance, this week we have a corporate site visit to DC, so we're going to be going to Cement as well as touring the FBI building that's in DC there. That's an incredible opportunity. So it's all about what you put into the club, correct? How exactly. many people around would you say are in your club? There's like probably like two to 250 um, members that join and um, are active. That's impressive. Um, and so for you, what do you see coming about in your future career and how has WIB impacted the way that you'll enter the workforce? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say ultimately the organization itself is just where, very well run. I remember like my freshman year, I joined a bunch of different clubs, um, sort of like unsure where to go. And I just noticed that all of like the executive board of women in business, um, they were very well spoken. They were very involved in different things and they all had like jobs lined up. Um, so it seemed like a good thing to get involved with. But but through getting involved more, I would just say that we have a lot of like corporate um, partnerships with companies. So it's like a great network to sort of expose yourself to, but also you just surround yourself with a bunch of like very highly motivated individuals, again, that are super involved in other things as well, um, but also just focused on having a good time in college and then growing professionally as well. Amazing. And I know that you both actually have summer internships lined up. If you'd like to tell our audience members how WIB has um, giving you those opportunities or impacted your way to choosing that? Yeah, of course. So I think that WIB has helped me develop professionally and be more confident and comfortable speaking in an interview setting or just with recruiters in general. So I would definitely say that um, my role within Women in Business the past three years has helped me to land my summer internship this summer. Fantastic. Um, for those members of the audience that are super inspired right now, could you let them know how is the best way to go about getting involved? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so just like at really any other club, we are at like the involvement fairs and things like that. Um, but if you really just like Google Penn State Women in Business, um, our social media should come out. We're on like Instagram, Twitter, um, and then our email is just womeninbusiness at psu.edu. So really any of those ways would be great. Fabulous. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it and great luck with the PWPW conference. <laughs> um, stay tuned because after the break, we will have the weather report coming up next. From the students of Penn State Meteorology, here is your Penn State Campus Weather Service forecast. Hello and good evening, State College. I am student meteorologist Ryan Gold with the Campus Weather Service. And for you spring lovers, I've got some great news. We'll have a little bit of a weekend warm-up. Not a whole lot in terms of rain. A little bit on Thursday into Friday, but we'll still be seeing a lot of sun for the majority of this week and a fantastic look for the first weekend of April. But now let's take a look at the not so distant future. Tuesday afternoon of around 3.30, this is around the warmest time of the day, we'll be seeing around 47 degrees. Now that is well below average for this time of year. In State College, it's around 60 degrees. And if you look at the edges there in Erie, all the way down to Pittsburgh, and even over in Philadelphia, 50 degrees across the board in those areas. But these temperatures will get a lot warmer as we can see that the winds are blowing up from the south. That's going to be bringing a lot more tropical, warmer air. That high pressure is really circulating that air and bringing it up into our area. So we'll get a weekend warm up. But in terms of tonight, 25 degrees. It's pretty cold, especially for this time of year, but not a whole lot in terms of uh, wind to really worry about. But you're still going to want to bundle up for tonight. But for tomorrow, like I said, 47, around 47, 48. Mix of sun and clouds. We'll be seeing a little bit stronger winds, not a whole lot, but those gusts you're going to want to worry about if you're susceptible to that. You're going to want to bundle up. Those 13 mile per hour wind gusts are not going to be too friendly, but we're still well below average for this time of year. And we won't be seeing closer to average until the weekend, but we can see that here in our seven day forecast. Well, like I said, Tuesday, 
47, 48. Wednesday around 58. And as well, once we get to Thursday, overnight showers bringing into Friday. They're going to taper off around Friday evening. But then Saturday is when we start that really, really warm up. Lots of sun, not too many clouds. And then Sunday and Monday are going to be our warm days. You can, the best times to get out there, go jogging, play volleyball on Old Main Law, or, or just get your yard work done. It's fantastic weekend for the first weekend of April. For the Campus Weather Service, I'm student meteorologist Ryan Gold. Felony charges against Empire actor Jesse Smollett for faking a hate crime were dropped in Chicago court because, according to the prosecutor's office, the jury was, quote, uncertain. Smollett, who is African American and openly gay, alleged that he was attacked in January by two men yelling racist and homophobic slurs. Key details have been released since, revealing that Smollett paid two men to stage the attack because he was, un un because he was reportedly unhappy with his salary and wanted to bolster his career. Kim Fox, the Cook County State Attorney, published an op-ed in, in the Chicago Tribune Friday explaining the case involving Smollett, who was charged with 16 counts of disorderly conduct and a Class 4 felony. Fox defended her office's decision in the op-ed, saying that her office was uncertain it had enough evidence to gain a conviction and wanted to focus on bigger issues in Chicago. Fox wrote, quote, We must separate the people at whom we are angry from the people of whom we are afraid, end quote. Samantha Josephson, a 21-year-old University of South Carolina student, was murdered after mistakenly entering the car of a South Carolina man named Nathaniel D. Rowland, who she thought was her Uber driver. Josephson was said to have been seen on surveillance footage entering a black Chevrolet Impala the morning of her disappearance, and her body was discovered in Clarendon County at around 3.30 p.m. Friday. Roland has been charged with kidnapping and murder after blood matching that of Josephson was found in his vehicle. Uber has released a statement urging users to cross-check the license plate number, make, and model of the car to the one in the app in order to ensure they are entering the correct vehicle. Former Nevada Assemblywoman Lucy Flores has accused former Vice President Joe Biden of unwanted kissing and touching before a campaign rally in 2014. Flores claimed that Biden had put his hands on her shoulders and gave her a prolonged kiss on the back of the head, additionally stating that she felt powerless in the moment. Biden defended himself against Flores' accusations, saying in a statement on Sunday, quote, not once, never, did I believe I acted inappropriately, end quote. Biden additionally said that he will listen respectfully to any accusations, but doubled down that nothing potentially inappropriate he did was intentional. The accusations come ahead of what is expected to be a potential announcement of a presidential run for Biden. Flores said that Biden's behavior disqualifies him from a potential run. And while top Democrats agree that Flores should be believed, they aren't counting him out just yet. Following President Trump's recent act of declaring a national emergency in order to secure funding for his proposed wall, he tweeted out a threat to close the U.S.-Mexico border if the Mexican government does not stop the entry of undocumented citizens into the U.S. A wall would not stop the influx of migrants seeking asylum, though, as they would just have to cross the river to be in the U.S. territory. The facilities currently being used to house migrants seeking asylum are built to hold one single adult male, but are currently instead holding entire families, and the number of migrants is continuing to climb. Director of Immigration and Cross-Border Policy Teresa Brown referred to the overcrowding of facilities as, quote, a system-wide collapse, end quote. And that's all for tonight on PSN News. Be sure to check us out on Twitter at PSN News. Have a good night, Penn State.